My name is David Blanco. I'm the Director of Technical Operations and Business Development at Autosol. And today, Tim Yeager of Freewave and I will be discussing some of the uh, joint projects that we've been successful in recently with Autosol's Edge product, Edge ACM, and their uh, Zoom series, Zoom Link, and Zoom IQ uh, Edge devices. Here's a very short agenda of my portion of the presentation. First, I'll give you all a very brief introduction to Autosol. Then I'll talk about traditional versus you know, modern SCADA. And then we'll talk about uh, being able to get increased data retrieval from field assets and also increased data reliability with the Autosol Freeway package. So Autosol is a leading provider of industrial communication software. We have been in business for over 30 years and our main product is called Autosol Communication Manager. It is a multi-protocol OPC polling engine that does over 300 different protocols, depending on how you count them up, as well as uh, real-time data. We also get historic or EFM data as well, convert that to OPC, present it to HMIs, or can publish it to CSV, CFX, TFX files, uh, whatever your clients need. We also have a Edge version of Autosol Communication Manager, or ACM, called Edge ACM. And what this is, is this is a lighter weight version of ACM. Instead of sitting on a Windows server, this version sits on Edge Linux devices, such as the Freeway Zoom Link and the Freeway Zoom IQ and Zoom Edge. And what this does right now is it does real-time polling of a number of protocols that I'll list shortly. And it converts that data protocol from whatever it is to MQTT or MQTT Spark Plug B allowing the user to also innovate how they handle it with dead bands, with some edge alarming, as well as being able to put uh, registers or tags in different tag groups and have those pull at different rates for more high resolution data on what matters and to maintain the, I guess, minimum operability standards of what they already have. And I'll go into more detail on that later in the presentation. AJCM can also continue to pull end devices during a comm outage between the field and the server or the field and the cloud, and then backfill all that data once communications are restored. So here are all the protocols that Edge ACM currently supports natively. Uh, you can pull ABB total flows, a uh, number of models, uh, ROC, ROC plus, basically anything that's been in the field the past 30 years. We took the protocols out of ACM, so we didn't reinvent the wheel. We just put the wheel on, on a new vehicle, basically. And then we also have Modbus, but since there's no such thing as just Modbus, we have a number of built-in extensions that are common in the oil and gas industry, Autopilot, Enron, Daniels, Flow Automation, Omni, Skatapath, and Lufkin, amongst others, as well as the ability for clients to make custom Modbus register sets and then basically templatize them to be able to install them on multiple devices with easy configuration. We also talked to Alan Bradley, Control Logics CIP. And here's a very high-level overview of how Edge ACM and Freeway fit into a SCADA model. So here's your end device, total flow, rock, bottom bus, SCADA pack, what have you. And then you have your Zoom IQ deployed in the field with some sort of communication connection to the end device. Edge ACM can talk to both serial and uh, TCP-based end devices. And then we pull that into the inter protocol, convert it to MQTT, and feed it back up to the server HMI. And this is the 10,000 foot view. I'll drill, I'll drill down into more detail here. Uh, here's a quick roadmap for Edge ACM. We currently have four of our developers bringing down EFM capability out of ACM to put on the edge. That way clients can collect that historic data locally in the field for uh, ease of collection. Uh, we also have a remote and mass management application that sits on the server side and allows clients to change the configuration and licensing of deployed Edge ACM solutions. We have TLS 1.2 built in as long, along with username and passwords. We also have uh, MQTT upgrades coming in like UDT support. We can also publish to Azure now and by September we'll have OPC UA connectivity from Edge ACM as well. Uh, as well as uh, with Spark Plug B. We'll also have a short local, oh, sorry, a small local visualization so that way clients can see the value of tags as they pull locally to verify that they have the correct tag or register set on the device. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, traditional versus modern SCADA. And we use modern to mean it could be the IIoT, digitization, industry 4.0, just that 
that kind of broad idea of the next generation SCADA. But I'm going to give some context to what we think that means in order to help give meaning to our two uh, basically white paper cases that I'll be presenting on at the end here. So here's your traditional SCADA architecture. You have your end devices there, some form of communication, uh, radios, cell phones, I mean, uh, cell modems, etc. You have a polling engine such as ACM, which talks the native protocol to the end devices and then converts that to OPC for an HMI. The structure of this is based on poll response, right? So an operator has a list of a thousand tags he wants in this HMI, and he polls and then gets the data from the end device. So if he needs a thousand tags, he will send a request for, let's just say, all thousand down the end device. But let's say only like a hundred or two hundred of them changed, right? He's still going to send all one thousand tags up, even if they haven't changed. So he's still going to use a hundred percent of that bandwidth, and also at least what. We see at Autosol, and I spent uh, about five years as a systems integrator, and I saw this quite often, because the HMI is where this field data becomes contextualized and gains value, right? So let's say a total flow sends a value of 1,500 back up to the HMI. Well, 1,500 what? This is where it gets its context to see, oh, this is a 1,500 you know, PSI on a very important piece of my infrastructure at a river crossing, et cetera. So what happens oftentimes is because of this poll response structure, the HMI gets burdened with being the only source where all of this data is stored and then has to serve both the operators for their safety and production function as well as other business units. So I'm going to go through some of the, I guess, poll rates of existing protocols. And for, for the purpose of this, I'm going to focus on Modbus and Rock. Uh, not for any particular reason other than that is just what I and uh, a, a developer I worked on this with named Cody Pinnell were most familiar with in our experience. And we could set up tags in a MABA simulator and a rock. So here's the architecture we use to run this test in our test lab, right? We have a Modbus device and a rock device that are polling locally to our laptop and we're observing the uh, bandwidth consumption via Wireshark. We're using ACM to poll and just showing that data in OPC test client to verify that the values are correct. So the first one we tested was Modbus. We did Modbus TCP and we pulled 1,000 tags evenly across the four sets of registers for Modbus. We pulled everything at five seconds and we did it at varying intervals between 10 to 30 minutes and with varying change rates of the value. So we have 1,000 tags with 1% down to 50% actually changing every five seconds. So this is what that looks like with Modbus, right? We have our interval here, so 600 seconds, 10 minutes, 1,000 tags, our change rate of 1%, 5%, 10%, 25, and 50, and then the total data consumed. So 2,875 for 1%, 2,892 for 50%, with a very, very little change. Of course, you break that down to kilobits a second, and you get an average and median of 4.81 and 4.81 for each one. So we didn't, you know, since the average and median are the same, we didn't have an outlier that was skewing any of these results. And basically, no matter what the rate of change was, we used the same amount of bandwidth because it's poll response. We have to send every value that was requested up every time. Now we did another test with Modbus as well, where we changed the time interval from 10 minutes to 30 minutes, but we left the rate of change at 10% to kind of hammer home this point of, again, 4.81 and 4.8. So there's not a lot of deviation in how much bandwidth was consumed, no matter how long we polled or what the rate of change was, because in poll response, we send everything that's requested no matter what. Now on Rock, we had a very similar setup but it's harder to get a rock emulator going, and we can only set up so many points on a rock. So uh, we did uh, 100 tags, because that's all we knew how to do. And it's the same kind of thing, a five second poll rate with a 10 to 30 minute interval, and then one to 50% rate of change for the value of those tags. And here are the results from the rock test. So again, we have our time interval, 10 minutes, our tags, 100, Rate of change, 1%, 10, 20, 25, and 50. And ultimately, our uh, bit rate here, and this is significantly smaller than the Modbus because we have one-tenth of the number of tags. But again, the average and median are the same, 0 0.32, 0 0.32 kilobits a second used to bring 100 rock tags over. 
So now I'm going to talk about a little bit of how this stacks up compared to a modern SCADA protocol called MQTT. And specifically, MQTT Spark Club B is what we did these tests over. So a little bit of background on MQTT, it is a publish ascribe message format. So the edge devices like Edge ACM publish this data up to a central broker, and then other software subscribe to this broker for specific pieces of information and then can get that information. And I'll, I'll have a chart that lays out the whole system in a second here. But basically, MQTT runs on top of TCP IP, so you can inherit a lot of the security features from that into MQTT. It's also very lightweight because it allows report by exception. So with our pull response scenario from earlier, I was saying if I'm requesting a thousand tags and really only a hundred changed, with MQTT, I would only send up a hundred. I wouldn't send up all 1,000. So I would immediately reduce how many tags I'm sending up by 900. So in theory, seeing a 90% reduction of bandwidth consumption. And also for MQTT, it has a uh, namespace called Spark Plug B. Now there's MQTT and then there's MQTT Spark Plug B. The difference being there is no standard namespace for MQTT. So just because someone has MQTT doesn't mean that anybody else can work with that JSON message format from that particular software. But if I, as Autosol, say I follow the Spark Plug B namespace and then I want to connect to something like Pi, which also follows the namespace, we are going to be interoperable out of the box without any question. So this, this standard here has really helped the adoption of MQTT into a broader part of our business. And here is how a MQTT SCADA network would look like. You have your end devices here. And you could replace your existing communications with something like a Zoom link radio and put EACM in that. Or you can keep your existing communication as well and use the Zoom IQ, which is like an industrialized switch that can run edge software like Edge ACM, and just put it behind that existing radio or cell modem, and then be able to basically, you still pull the end device near the end of protocol. It's converted to MQTT here and sent up to a broker where multiple pieces of software can then subscribe to the broker for the data that they want. So this does a couple things that address some of the pain points of pull response. The first is I'm reducing the bandwidth consumption of this network because I'm only sending up what's changed. And with Edge ACM, you could set dead bands and alarms and separate, you know, let's say you have a compressor station with 9,000 tags that you, want, that you want in. Well, your HMI doesn't want all 9,000 tags, right? Your operator might want 200, 300 max of those tags. So Edge ACM can send all 9,000 tags to the broker. The HMI can just subscribe to the couple hundred that it wants. And the other nine, you know, all 9,000 can be dumped into the cloud or your data warehouse. So multiple clients can consume the data at the same time from the same point because we are adding context to the, or you can add context to the point here in the field. So with uh, metadata and templates you can add into Spark Plug B, I can say this tag at 1,500 is uh, you know, a pressure out of river crossing on whatever pipeline. So when it, when it reaches the broker, everything sees the same data in a uniform fashion. And it frees the HMI from being the only source where this data is actually contextualized on a network. So to drill down more into what's happening on the edge device, so here's a Zoom IQ, for example. Uh, what is Edge ACM actually doing, right? Edge ACM is pulling multiple protocols simultaneously from multiple devices. And I want to emphasize that point. It's not where you can only pull, let's say, five total flows or five uh, Allen Bradleys at a time. You can do four Allen Bradleys and a rock. You can mix and match. The uh, only restriction on how many devices and how many tags and what resolution is hardware-based. So it's kind of a mix and match project. So Edge ACM pulls multiple devices, multiple protocols, converts that to MQTT or Spark Plug B, as most of our deployments are, and then pushes that up to a broker in the field of cloud. So to compare MQTT to Modbus and MQTT to Rock, this was our setup. The same as what we did earlier, with the exception of we put a Zoom IQ running Edge ACM between the end device and our laptops now. So we're publishing to a broker, and that data is coming up in really a Chrome extension called MQTTFX. It, which is just like an OBC test client. They're showing us the values of the data for us to verify that the data was good. So polling Modbus and MQTT at the same time, these were the results, right? So we have the same time interval, 10 minutes here, 1,000 Modbus, Modbus tags for both, the same tags. 
our rate of change, 1, 5, 10, 25, and 50, and here was the real meat of it, right? So at a 1% rate of change, Modbus used 2,875 kilobytes, MTTT, 29. At 50% change of tags, Modbus used 2,892. MQTT used 40, 438. So basically, with MQTT uh, versus Modbus, with a 1% rate of change, 98.99% reduction of bandwidth consumption, and that 50% rate of change, 84.73%. So the relationship between bandwidth saved and rate of change on the points with Modbus is not linear. You know, it's it's not one for one. Of 50% of the tags are changing, so I should see a you know 50% reduction in bandwidth. It's actually much more. Um, and again, the uh, with the decrease here, we can see it in a, di in a different way on a bar graph. So the blue is your traditional demand response in Modbus, and the gray smidge there, and the gray bump here is how much bandwidth was consumed via MQTT for bringing back the same data. Now for Rock, oh sorry, th this is the uh, Modbus with the rate of change held steady at 10%, but the time interval going from 10 minutes to 30 minutes. So we're polling 10% rate of change on the tag, so longer period of time, and we basically see a uh, standard decrease of bandwidth consumption of 95 0.8, reduction in bandwidth consumption that holds across all, as we would expect, because with traditional poll response, it doesn't matter. Every poll is going to occupy the same amount of data. So this Modbus data consumption, 2,900 to 9,100, is linear, based on how, how long we're polling it. And to visualize that, 96% reduction of bandwidth consumption across the board. Now for Rock, uh, it's the same story as Modbus, right? 10 minute polling for each one, 100 tags, rate of change, 1, 10, 20, 25, and 50. And the bit rate decrease between 1% was 89% and 50% was 57.89. Not as shocking as the Modbus, but still effective in the field. And doubly so when clients can, because in this test, everything was on the same tag group. But if you want to separate out on different tag groups in NJCM and have, let's say, I have a plunger well, and I really care about the five points on that plunger well, I can have them in a tag group to pull them every second or every minute, and then all other 2,000 tags I have coming off of this edge device, I, have, I can have them on a separate tag group and pull once an hour. So in that case, a client would see 96.26% reduction in bandwidth consumption. And I know that because that's the use case I'm going to talk about later in the paper on rocks. And here is that same thing visualized in a bar graph. So 89% to 57.89% reduction in bandwidth. So to really talk about some of the benefits here of uh, the modern versus traditional SCADA. The first, of course, is reduced bandwidth consumption. So because we're handling the data for SCADA purposes on the edge, we can reduce bandwidth consumption with just basic MQTT report by exception, let alone fancy tricks with tag groups, which then allows us to get higher resolution data for the tags that the client actually care about to address specific pain points and increase either, you know, reduce cost or increase production for gas or oil wells. It also <clears throat> lets you kind of break out of that traditional chain that you are in, in traditional SCADA with the HMI being the only place for data that's contextualized. It also helps re uh, basically reduce noise levels out in the field, right? Less Less chatter on the radio network makes the chatter, sorry, makes the communications more reliable. So I'm going to talk about some of these benefits realized from actual field deployments that we have done. Uh, the first is going to be by increasing data retrieval with a company called Flywheel Energy. They have about 4,000 gas wells in Arkansas and East Oklahoma, and we put AJCM on about 700 or 4,000 of those wells to help reduce bandwidth consumption and bring in higher resolution data for plunger lifts in order to uh, help them optimize the production on these wells with plunger lifts. And then we also helped increase data reliability for a company here in Colorado called Red Cedar Gathering. Uh, they were facing steep EPA fines because of missing data on their compressor stations, and what we did with EJCM was we backfill that data when there's outage 
to help them avoid EPA fines. And I'll go into more detail on both of these now. So this is Flywheel's architecture. They have rock, rock that in the field. They are replacing their radios with Zoom Links with EACM or Edge ACM already installed on them. And basically, Edge ACM is pulling thousands of tags on each one of these rocks, publishing it via MQTT to a broker, where it's being natively consumed via MQTT spark plug B in their ignition HMI. So to drill a little down further, right, they have gas producing wells and the two types of devices that they actually have on the wells with plunger lifts are rocks, one of rock, sorry, flow boss 107s and rock 800s. And about half of these are serial, which was not a problem for us because edge ACM is built in with something called priority forward pet pending, that basically allows for people to put EACM in front of a serial device. EACM can then detect when other traffic is trying to get a hold of that serial device, e either if it's Rocklink or whatever, you know, PCCU, whatever the configuration software of the end device is, or EFM collection, it will then automatically stop Edge ACM, allow that traffic through, wait till that connection releases, and then automatically restart Edge ACM to poll and log the whole event. So that way, if someone says, well, why is there this gap in data? Ah, someone, someone was talking through priority forward and stopped Edge ACM to allow this other prioritize traffic through. Now, Flywheel made use of that technology on about half of these, and it uh, also is still doing it over 900 megahertz radio with the Zoom link. So basically, they were polling once an hour on their traditional SCADA uh, before they had the Edge ACM. And when they deployed Edge ACM, because they were able to take apart their tags, one tag group was focused on high resolution polling of the five points on their plunger lift, other tag group did all the other points. So for the tags that they cared about, we got one minute data from one hour data. So 60 times the data resolution for the tags that needed optimization. Here is a trend from their ignition system, and they've got five points on this trend. Tubing casing, static pressure, flow rate, and plunger step. Flow rate is the pink one on top. The plunger step is the black one. This is a one hour trend with their traditional polling. And you can see there's one change because they only pulled it once in the hour, right? 2,229 tags from this one Rock 800. Now, this is what that same hour looked like using Edge ACM. So the big difference here is uh, we actually caught the plunger step. So we actually show activity on the plunger. This one had nothing on the plunger step. And this is the same number of tags, but now one minute polling for these tags that matter. So again, 60 times the data resolution using oh, all the same existing infrastructure, basically. So just kind of extrapolate on this, this is what one day trending of traditional polling looks like, right? A little bit of change in flow, but again, we've missed every single change of plunger step, tubing, casing, static, pressure, missed all of that. It's very hard to make an optimization decision based off this data, and the client agreed this is a comment from the technician that we worked with to make this deployment for Flywheel. And uh, the big part here is basically this data is useless because we've captured none of the plunger step with traditional polling. So this is what it looks like one day with Edge ACM. So this is actually information that they were able to make an optimization decision on in 1 14th of the time it used to take. They told us it used to take them seven to 14 days after they made a tweak to their plunger lift to see if that worked, to see if the optimization took effect. So we took it from 14 days to less than one day for them because we can get them higher resolution data. And here's a bigger comparison of the three day trends, traditional polling. Again, they missed every single plunger step and almost every change of all their different uh, tubing and casing pressures. And with Edge ACM, we basically captured everything that's happened. We captured every plunger step, we captured every change of flow rate, we've captured the, the relationship between flow rate, plunger step, and pressures very, very nicely for them here. So basically with traditional SCADA, one hour polling, seven to 14 days optimization cycle. With Edge ACM, one minute polling on what they cared about, and one day, uh, sorry, one, one to two day optimization decisions. And ultimately what this helped them do was increase production. And that's where our legal ability to share information ends on this particular one. Yes, sir. The reason they were polling at one hour was? Because they, they could not. have enough bandwidth? Yes, sir. Okay, so they were limited to the hour. 
Yes, sir. Their sampling was physically limited by the communications bandwidth available. Yes, even after they switched their polling engine from uh, a different one to ACM on their server side, it still just ended up being that they had these remote units and a 900 megahertz radio connection through rural can uh, Arkansas. So they experimented with, you know, 45, 30 minutes, but ultimately they were still stuck with an hour. Reliably with an hour. So the other one is data buffering with modern, modern methods, which is basically a JCM with MQTT. And uh, in traditional SCADA rights, let's say that I lose connection between the field and the server. Unless I'm using DMP3, I think, or I have a very elaborate method set up about extrapolating real-time data from historic data stored on the device, I've missed this poll. Right? If there's fog, pine trees, what have you, if I lost communication to the field, chances are my HMI is going to miss that data. Now, with Edge ACM, it's a little different. So if I lose connection here, as long as power is still on site, Edge ACM just keeps trucking along. And once this connection is reestablished, that is when I start sending data up. So here is what it looks like in the HMI signet, because I guess I should make this point here. Edge ACM is not limited to one HMI. Edge ACM is designed to integrate with existing HMIs that require OPC, for example, as well as any, so like Signet 9.2 and up has an MQTT Spark Plug B module. So this is a Signet 9.2 implementation from July 2nd of last year. The top here is uh, data we brought in with Edge ACM directly into Signet. The bottom here is uh, Signet's built-in polar. So there was an outage on site. Gray zigzag was some kind of heartbeat or something. The teal line that you might be able to see from back there, but there is a teal line here on both, was an ESD point. And basically during this two hour span, operators were blind. Now the same, that was true as well during the moment here, but once communications were reestablished, as AJCM backfilled the data, you can set in your HMI, all of that data was, was ran through as real time data. So if there was an ESD trigger, an operator would have gotten the alarm and said, hey, something happened during this time period. It's an alarm, but it cleared. Maybe you should you know, acknowledge this and check it out. So here was Red Cedar's architecture. They have four compressor stations for each site with a Allen Bradley using CIP protocol. They put one Zoom IQ at each site running Edge ACM behind their existing telemetry. Then we brought that data into a MQTT broker, and we have a piece of Autosol software called Autosol MQTT to OPC. The HMI is ClearSCADA, or GeoSCADA now, but their version is still called ClearSCADA. And ClearSCADA has a MQTT driver, but it does not yet have a Spark Plug B driver, though that is in the works by Schneider. So since time was of the essence for them, because they are getting fined $40,000 for every missing data incident that they have, they told us, they wanted to get this out as soon as possible. So what we're doing is native protocol between Edge ACM and the device, MQTT to here. This converts everything coming off that broker to OPC DA. So an OPC DA client like ClearStata can then just get that data. And here's the cool trick. We integrated into their existing telemetry in the field with an IQ. That was the only capital investment. They redid absolutely none of their SCADA system. So in ClearSCADA, every point that they're bringing in in the field as MQTT is still an OPC analog or digital point in their ClearSCADA system, which means that they do not have to redo screens or queries or logic or any of the other business units that were getting data from those points as well. All they changed in their ClearSCADA system was instead of pointing their points at uh, their other server, they pointed it to a mo, and that was it. They changed one object in the HMI. So when they lost communications there, we were basically able to backfill it all in the clear data. So when the EPA auditors showed up, they looked at the history of the points and there was no missing data. And we can even flag the quality of the data that we backfilled as a different quality so they know, okay, this data was good because we pulled it successfully in the field, but it was backfilled during a comm outage. And from what I understand, that is acceptable to the EPA. So basically we helped them avoid fines from the Clean Air Act um, from what they told us, these points are the ones that they look for missing data on from compressor sites here in Colorado, as well as I believe in Pennsylvania and Ohio. It seems to be state by state. And this particular company was facing fines of up to $40,000 for each 
incident of missing data. So they have a couple of million dollars set aside each year to pay off the EPA. And with Edge ACM, they're able to avoid fines at these sites because we backfilled the data. And what they told us was these fines are actually smaller than what they should be because all of their wells are on uh, reservation land. And had they not been, the fines would have been higher. <clears throat> so here's a picture of uh, one of our engineers actually installing Edge ACM in the field. Let's just kind of repeat this point. This is a 900 megahertz MDS radio that we just plugged into the switch behind it. So there wasn't any change in the field connectivity. The telemetry all stayed the same. We were just able to piggyback on there and integrate seamlessly on both the field as well as the SCADA side for this client. So it was minimally invasive and uh, maximally cost savings. I should have practiced that line. So in conclusion to my portion, uh, the approach that we have seen our clients take and therefore we have followed with the IIoT digitization, whatever you want to call it, the modern SCADA, is not a sweeping change of, oh, well, you got to buy, you know, $4 million of SCADA to make any of this work. It's being able to leverage this technology at specific pain points to either increase production or cut costs. And that's what both of these examples were, right? With Flywheel, we brought in more data to help them optimize their process, basically on the same kind of existing telemetry, 900 megahertz radio, and help them make more money for each plunger well they had. With Red Cedar, we increase our data reliability and help them lower costs through the EPA by being able to backfill this SCADA data successfully into what they already had. <clears throat> and uh, with that, I will pass it off to Tim to talk about some free waves. Questions? Oh yeah, uh, any questions on this part so far? Yes, sir. So, you know, report by exception, gaps, no change. Your software, you know, if we have a regulatory situation that wants to see defined intervals, you, you essentially are going to deduce or create those for database entries. You know, one hour in between, no change. Somebody says, well, there's only two points here. No, I want to see all these other points. Something essentially has to create those and say, well, it, so your software does that. Yes. It uh, creates database entries for the no change data. To that level of detail, I cannot speak. Okay. But what I do know is that we can go to e to the negative 10 power decimal place, whatever that one is, and all of those points that they were bringing back go. So any change of, you know, to the hundred million thousands, whatever decimal point, we will register as a change and then require a publish on those compressor points at least the ones that the EPA wants to go for. So if it's a regulatory report on a valve status, yes, we can basically continue to pull it and say there was no change, but force a publish up to the broker. We can do that. But uh, we're not like um, manipulating any data on the database side or anything like that. We, we just, if the data didn't change, we can force a publish. Otherwise, we let the dead bands and alarms that you can set on a JCM play out. What the alarms on Edge ACM do is there's a high and a low. They're not there to replace SCADA alarms by any means. They're there to act as a tool for higher resolution. So what you can have is if I have an alarm on a pressure or an ESD, for example, I have an alarm on an ESD and it triggers, well, I can have a tag group of 50 points on this site. And when one point on this tag group goes into alarm, everything on that tag group goes from maybe a 10 second pull rate to a one second pull rate. So I, I can get a high resolution picture of what's happening during a alarm setting. Once the alarm clears, I revert back to my standard pull rate. And when, uh, when, a, when a certain point is an alarm, we ignore that point's dead band as well. So that way, if you have a pressure and you say, okay, let me see, my high alarm on this pressure is 3,000. It hits 3,001. We publish every single change of that up or down until it clears out of the high alarm or the low alarm status to make sure that you're getting a high resolution picture and that we are not going to sit on an alarm that an operator should be taking action on. Any other questions or comments? All right, well, with that, I will pass it on to Tim. Thank you. So, Autosol is the software that is providing all of the feedback to the operators of this. We are the hardware platform. I've got the three um, that we're talking about 
uh, out here. I'll hand around later uh, after the presentation. So we're going to go with who we are. You know, what is the free wave ecosystem? What's all involved with that? What is free wave IQ? The current IQ specifications, the Zoom link, which is our radio version of the product, uh, what their capabilities are, and update on IQ2. So some of you we've been talking to about IQ2. And then the Zoom Edge, which is a product right now that will hit general availability at the end of this month, but we do have one of the alpha units right there as well. So who is Freewave? So we've been in business 26 years, Colorado-based company. All manufacturing is done here in Colorado and Boulder. We have over 5,000 customers globally with 32 countries that we work in. We are a tier one IIoT provider in the oil and gas. We are in all 30 of the top 30 oil and gas companies out there. <coughs> So a little bit about the ecosystem. Um, I had the engineers dumb it down for me because I'm in sales, I'm like David who has a technical background. So I did it to the iPhone. So view um, our platform basically as the iPhone. And then what IQ is, is the op operation system, iOS of that. And then like Autosol would be uh, an application that is running on that as well. And then we have some edge sensing devices, which are actually the data that provides into the Autosol unit. And with this, you're seeing both um, an enclosed version and we do have board level versions that are put into PLCs and other panels that are out there. What is FreeWave uh, IQ? It is an environment for applications to be run in. Um, we are not an application developer. We work with best of breed, such as Autosaw, to run the third-party apps onto our devices. You can get them in just an edge computing device that is hardened, class one div two, or you can get one with a radio that is included in that as well. We can convert any network into an MQT, MQTT network, whether it be wireline or wireless, whether it be our radio product or someone else's radio product. David spoke to that where one of the case studies was actually our radio product, the other one was an MDS radio product. So we are cost effective. You do not have to make a wholesale change of your infrastructure to be able to run um, the Autosol product on our product. We see a lot of people running testing on Raspberry Pi. But the problem with Raspberry Pi is the temperature settings and it's not necessarily as ruggedized as ever, everything else. We are a ruggedized platform that is low power consumption and is reliable to deploy out there in the field. Some rough uh, specifications. We use Debian Linux right now, version nine. Um, we have tested it with JavaScript, Java, Python, Node-RED, C++, and more. It comes in a three port and a four port version of this. Um, two main differentiators is the four port version of it has one gigabit of storage. Three port has a 512 RAM of storage and the extra port that we're talking about is an ethernet port. So it all comes with two serial ports and one or two ethernet ports. And with nomenclature, you can get it either in a board level version of this product or you can get it in an enclosed version of this product as well. So a lot of people are familiar with us, with our legacy products, the FGR series um, and the DGR series. A few years ago, we released the latest version of our product, which is called, what we've called the Zoom Link. It's a 900 megahertz product. It is IQ enabled. The previous versions did not have the ability to run any IQ on there. 
You can do it as a peer-to-peer, -peer, um, and it's basically can be formatted in almost like a spider web type of design. Um, you have flexible speeds that you can choose on here. Um, we always recommend starting lower end, working your way up so you can get the most reliable. Um, again, we're looking very low power consumptions. More than half of our deployments are being run on solar right now. So we are very aware of how much power we use. Some of the ways that we have uh, increased data on this product line versus the previous one is forward error correction, packet compression, and packet aggregation. You can turn on and off these features and it gives you various um, benefits to you out there. We also are adaptive learning where a lot of radios talk and then listen, we actually listen first and then talk. And what that does is let you uh, configure your network so you're avoiding the most of the interference as possible. We do have the ability to even cut off half of the spectrum if that is super noisy and then work in the other half or down to a single channel if that works what you need. Some of the key specifications, again, we're operating in the unlicensed band of the 900 megahertz spectrum. Um, very temperature resilient out there. We have them deployed in deserts. We have them deployed in both poles. So we can do hot and cold. Class 1 Div 2. Uh, two serial ports, again, being able to run those various protocols. And then also on the 4 port, again, you have an extra uh, Ethernet port on there. Migration. So a lot of the producers out there have our radios already or another uh, manufacturer's radios. So we had to build out a migration path. This is not a wholesale rip and replace type of scenario. You can get it so the master is replaced by a Zoom link on one side and then all the Zoom link radios would talk to that master, whereas the other radios would talk to the other master up there and do a coexistence type of deployment with that. And what that does is we've tested this out and you're not getting necessarily interference from each one because we are listening before we talk. We are doing a March release of IQ 1.2. So it is a precursor to the 2.0. It has a lot of features on there where 2.0 will be um, released Q2. The big thing is a different user interface. Very intuitive, uh, drag drop, um, and it also will give you the ability to enable Wi Fi capability and configuring another radio. To do that, you would utilize the USB port and use a Wi-Fi dongle on that. It would just be an access point. It is not another transition or transmission um, out to a different type of radio. So it's just for hotspots. And again, it's very intuitive when you work with this. Um, security tags on there. You can turn off your SSID because most of the IT departments do not want any SSID, especially out on the pad as a backdoor. And you also comes with WPA security as well, built into it. I2, IQ2 is coming. Um, most of this is an upgraded version of the Debian Linux. It allows to have containers built into there for easy app deployments. Um, you can use the USB port to do some configuration of this as well. So it's much easier to configure it again. Same user interface that is on the 1.2. Um, it's being rolled out with that. It also has some uh, HTTPS security features that we are being asked for to put in there. And it also is going to enable Ethernet capability over serial. You'd still be transmitting over the serial radio, but it'll give you a smart um, interface so you can get more information on that radio and also allow um, 
computing at the edge. So most of the radios that we have deployed in the previous generation are all serial radios. So this gives a trans, an upgrade path to customers so they don't have to do a rip and replace. Zoom Edge. So this is our newest product that we will be releasing at mid-April timeframe. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with our long range IO product. It was a serial based IO. This is Ethernet. So it allows you to do Ethernet IO. Also has the same computing functionality in there as the Zoom Link and Zoom IQ. We have tested it currently to 10 mo uh, modules stacked high and it, I'll pass that around and it just comes as the base unit and then has various expansion modules that you can just snap in there. And it is the same modules that are being used on the FGR2 radios currently. And we have been talking for the past couple years about um, rolling out online training. It is now available. Uh, it is serial radios are available right now. Uh, you would just get, log in, get a log into the training session. There's lots of modules. Do not be uh, worried about the number of the modules. Some of those are two minutes long and it just gives you uh, refreshers. You can also use this when you're in the field to cover a certain area that you may not be familiar with doing as well. We just got finishing, finishing up, um, the ethernet portion of this training. So that will be rolling out uh, sometime in, in Q2 as well. And after that, we will be doing the IO product line and rolling that out as well. And this is going to be giving you a certification if you complete it. It is gonna be part of our partner program. So you're, you're gonna to have to have a technician certified in each of the three versions um, to be one of our partners and to work on the product. Questions? So, David covered most of the meat. Um, this is just more on the platform side of it. Questions at all? Either lunch is kicking in or uh, we did a good job. So I'm going to hand out, hand around these. <laughs>